Hello, it's me, Johanna, and I'm back here today to teach you about Business Management Chapter 5.5, which is all about stock control and production planning. Let's get right into it. So a lot of what I'm talking about today I have mentioned previously, so I will be linking some of the videos, and specifically I mean when I talked about 5.1 and also when I talked about 5.3, they will come into hand in this chapter. So make sure you watch that before this video. So the supply chain process. This is essentially a wide system of connected organizations. So you go from the supplier to the manufacturer to the distributor. You know, you're going like that. But there are two different types of flows that have to be managed. There's the flow from raw material to finished product. Um, which is then purchased by the customer. So this is sort of like the supplier, the manufacturer, the distributor, the customer. You know, that's that chain. And then there's a different one, which is the flow of information. So this is from the consumer to the supplier. So essentially just giving information, stuff like that. So this can be seen as two dimensions. You can call them the logistics and the information and communication. So just in time versus just in case. So just as a reminder, just in time, I said just so much right there, but anyhow, just in time is a method of stock control where you avoid holding any stock at all because the suppliers will give you the products when necessary. So you try to essentially save storage and stuff like that. So just in case is then when you hold reserves both of the raw material and also the finished product just in case sudden increase in demand happens. So the differences between these two, so for just in time, stock is bought when required for just in case, stock is stored as reserves. Just in time is beneficial for working capital since you're saving money on storage, which means you can use more of your money for day-to-day -day activities just in case reduces pressure on the cash flow, just in time reduces storage costs, just in case reduces costs by buying in bulk where you can get you know special prices for that, just in time reduces the chance of holding stock that cannot be sold, there's also less chance of damaged or ruined stock, for just in case, you can meet changes in demand and there's also less delivery issues or waiting time for customers. Just in time will create a closer relationship with your supplier. And just in case has the advantage that the supplier will not charge you higher prices to be speedier because obviously if you're doing just in time, they have to be very quick. Now we have to discuss how you actually do stock control. So this graph is sort of just like a little summary of the of what stock control essentially is. So you have to think of two things. You have to think of the cost of not having stock when required, and then the cost of holding stock when you don't require it. So here you can see total cost of stock, cost of holding stock, and cost of stock out. Now that dotted line between the middle basically shows the economic order quantity, which is the amount that should be ordered for any given time period. So um, if you're asked a question about stock control where you have to draw a graph, I'm gonna show you here how to do it. So you have to know certain things. So the initial order, so that is the amount of stock delivered, for example, at the start of the year. So this is the max stock. So you make a dotted line by the max stock, and then you make a minimum stock line as well. And that's the amount um, of stock that is held, and that's the minimum amount of stock that is held at any given period of time. So the things below the minimum stock level is the buffer stock, like that's your reserves. Then you have to know how much is being bought uh, per month or per day. You ha by the way, you have to label your axes and the, the horizontal axis is time, and this time it's in months. Meanwhile, the vertical axis is stock. So it's 
300 per month, let's say. So if I minus 600 from 150, I know that there are three 300s there. So I know it will take three months to reach that. So you draw a line from the max stock to three months, but like on the minimum stock line, you don't draw it all the way down to three months. Then you need to know the lean time, which is the amount of time it will take to for your supplier to get you the products, which is one month in this case. So I draw a dotted up line from one month before you reach the minimum stock, which is at two months. Then, then from that point where the uh, initial line you drew and the lean time meet, you draw a horizontal line. That line there is your reorder level. So essentially, this when you get to that level of stock, which is around 900, you have to reorder. Then, if you take your max stock minus your min stock, you will get your reorder quantity, which is the amount of stock that you need to order every time you reach your pre-order level. Yep, this is a little bit confusing. You might have to look back at it. I mean, it's not actually confusing, but I think I described it in a confusing way. So you might have to look back at this a couple times or look in your book. They actually have quite easy explanations there. So hopefully you'll understand. So the next thing we'll talk about is the optimal stock levels. And these are just some of the factors that you might have to think about when you're choosing your optimal stock factor. So the first one is the market. Uh, is the market growing? Do you have more competitors? Is the business increasing in sales? Stuff like that. And then there's the final product. Is it cheap? Is it uh, single use? Is it fast moving? Is it high volume? Um, you have to think about stuff like that. The stock. For instance, if you're doing something with milk, you might not be able to store it for very long, stuff like that. Uh, the infrastructure, um, in this case, we mean like, does weather or other factors influence the ability of the suppliers to meet your demand? Finance, do you have enough money to do this and also to like store things? But also, um, what possibilities can you make or like what deals are you able to make with your suppliers like can you buy in bulk and get it for way cheaper or can you like strike a deal because you have a good relationship with your supplier and stuff like that and then you have to think about what holding more storage implies for your human resources will you have to have more employees now and stuff like that so now we're going to go through calculations so there is Capacity utilization rate. So essentially, if you want to know how efficient your facility is and if you're using the maximum capacity, you can do this calculation. So this calculation is done by doing the actual output divided by the, divided by the productive capacity times 100. So essentially, actual output is how much you are selling, how much of what you're doing is being used, and then your productive capacity is the amount you can use. So the, the example they used in the book is a hotel has 100 beds and on average 80 beds are filled. Therefore you would take 80 divided by 100 times 100 which equals 80% and you want to be as close to 100% as possible. The next calculation you can do is the productivity rate. This essentially measures the efficiency of production so what you do is you do total output divided by total input times 100. Now for this calculation, it all depends on your competitors. You essentially want to benchmark your competitors and you want to be better than your competitors. So it's not like you want to be closer to 100 or closer to anything like that. It's in comparison to your competitors. So if the productivity rate is much lower than your industry average, then you should probably adopt a more lean strategy. Again, I went through what lean production was in 5.3, like chapter 5.3, and I will that video will be linked at the end because I have a playlist with all the business management videos I have made. If your productivity rate is much higher than the industry, you should be happy. So you might want to make the decision between making your products yourself versus buying your products. So there's cost to buy and cost to make. So for cost to buy, you do the price, 
per unit times quantity. And for cost to make, you do fixed cost plus, and then in brackets, variable cost per unit times quantity. Now, in my book, like my own business management book, this formula is actually wrong. I don't know why they wrote it incorrectly in here. They forgot to put the fixed cost plus. So make sure you plus the fixed cost for the cost to make. And obviously, whichever one is lower is the one that would be most desirable from a finance point of view. So that was it for chapter 5.5, production planning. Thank you for watching. You feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. You can follow me at Johanna Frenert. Goodbye. Hope you learned something.